I've never told anyone this, and I'm sorry, but I don't want to do this alone anymore. When I was studying for my PhD, I was allowed access to the archives at the British Library. I've always been interested in the novel Frankenstein and in its author, Mary Shelley. Although it had nothing to do with my studies, when I had access to the archives, of course, I wanted to have a look at some of her original writings. In those documents, there was one letter that always stuck with me. Mary Shelley had written it to her husband when he was away travelling in Italy. There was one sentence that caught my attention. It was a simple sentence that, in the context of the woman who created this timeless evil, really, in, in Dr Frankenstein, it, it seemed too strange to forget. I remember the exact words. The most terrible thing that I've ever done is to have encouraged the young John Hargreaves. It was a short letter and it didn't mention John Hargreaves again and the later letters didn't mention him again either. The name, the guilt in that phrase, it stuck with me. What did Shelley told him to do? It was by chance that uh, years later my brother moved to Highgate, it's an area famous for uh, the big Victorian cemetery, uh, North London area. After visiting him in November, it was a cold and wet night and I went home for a walk through the cemetery. And I remember reading that letter and I remember seeing that name. And as I was going through the cemetery, it was close to closing time, it was almost completely empty. I walked past a tomb of a man named John Hargreaves. Well, there were no other relative name on the door, just his name on the slab, a very simple stone box. I hesitated, of course looking to see if there was anybody around and I probably would have walked on except it seemed like the stone slab was just a tiny bit ajar. I hesitated a moment longer, looked around and well, I wanted to open it. I felt both ashamed and excited and I can still hear the sound of the rain falling on the grass I can feel the stone cold against my fingertips. London was distant and muffled and far away at that point. It was just me and that heavy stone and the sound it made as it slid against a century of dirt. I had a torch in my pocket. This was the time before mobile phones and didn't have a torch on the back to look at with and you often needed them to get around. I shone it inside and I could see seven steps leading down to a solid grey stone wall. In front of that wall was a low pedestal, um, it was like a speaker's lectern. As I stepped inside the tomb I could see that there were letters there sitting on the pedestal, two handwritten, uh, one of the letters was more like a scrap of paper really, just a scrawled note. I had a film camera with me, one of the old fashioned types, and I took some photos of them. First one read like this. To whomever it may concern, I regret that I have ever been involved with this, and hope that one day some other may be able to undo what has been done. Mr. John Hargreaves, encouraged by others and supported by myself, appears to no longer be with us. Yet, I do not also think that he has taken his own life. He came to me at a gathering with a story that seemed like such a marvellous adventure, but which 
I now wholly regret. Mr Hargreaves was a magician of some small esteem, known for his cunning illusions and use of the new conductive sciences. He told me that he had pushed further away from his former colleagues and circles due to a plan which was considered unacceptable to them. He spoke to us of two types of magic. A magic that was slow, in which the illusion happened through misdirection. And of another, where there was no illusion, only speed beyond the wit and reckoning of the eye. He had come to believe that time itself was another world and that the seconds on the clock would be divided and could be explored like the surface of the earth. He argued that each instant was a universe unto itself. He was most persuasive on the subject and I would have dismissed him if he had not also had the most intriguing calculations to accompany his views. I worked with him on the idea to cut open a slice into this fourth space. I added my own understanding of it to his calculations and we used some of the mechanical work of my dear friend, Mr. Babbage, uh, to bring Mr. Hargreaves' invention into being. It was a machine that would allow us to step into the universe of time, to be able to live as an immortal creature in an infinite moment outside of the needs of normal time, without need of food or water. The applications would be limitless, such as for the preservation of life or for medical treatment, uh, seclusion for artists to create or to allow our greatest minds ample time and opportunity to consider fully all possible paths before engaging in an action. We created our machine away from the eyes of London in the crypt of Whitechapel Church. And when he stepped into it, Mr. Hargreaves simply ceased to be. I had expected him to return post haste, seemingly instantly to myself, but with an immeasurable time having passed for him. But after three days of waiting, I was forced to unmake our creation for fear of discovery. I have since reassembled it elsewhere, but he has not returned. I place this letter beside another. The other witness within this tomb appeared at the same moment of my friend's disappearance on a desk placed beside the machine. Blinded by my excitement at the mathematics, I fear we have done something which cannot be undone, and I shall never see my wild-minded friend again. I place these letters here as a monument to his continued existence, and in the hope that one day a person may have resources greater than my own to set him free. Yours faithfully, Augusta Arda Lovelace. The second letter in the tomb was written in a rough hand, scrawled in a moment, it seemed. It was much harder to read than the, the elegant script of the first. It went as follows. I am here. The effort to move is too great, pushing through the ether, scratching at my skin. I cannot undo this. I put the sheets back on the lectern and I quietly resealed the tomb. As if in a trance, I took the tube to Whitechapel Church. Arriving long after dark had fallen, it was empty and I found 
a side entrance, overgrown but left open, and I made my way into the crypt of the church. I walked for a little while until I found a space which I knew must be where it had happened. I felt the strangest sensation like a wire wool being dragged across my skin and there was a sense there of something else, of madness. The most intense fear and rage at himself, but at the people who had helped him too. And further, at the people of London living these brief, beautiful lives all around him, able to breathe, communicate, love, and to pass away in a way that he would never be able to. Such jealousy and hatred. All I'll say is this, never go there. Never try to set him free. He will do terrible things to London if he ever escapes. Now you know this, you can share my burden too. I know where John Hargreaves is. I know he's alive. And I know we must never rescue him even if that means leaving him alone until the end of time itself. <laughs>